Every summer when I was a kid, I would spend a week with my grandparents on their farm in the rural community of Estella, Tennessee. They grew up without electricity and running water. They didn't have a bathroom until a year after they moved into the house my mom grew up in. The same house where this story takes place. It was the early 1990s and they still didn't have air conditioning. If you're not familiar, it gets really hot and humid in Tennessee during the summers, so every door and window would be open at their house, along with fans running 24-7, which made a nice white noise that still makes me drowsy to this day. We were getting ready for bed and all but asleep on this particularly muggy evening. Often, I would sleep in the front bedroom with Mima, mainly because Papa was a heavy snorer and they rarely slept in the same bed anymore. Before I go any further, I should explain some of the layout of their house. One half of the house's layout is comprised of a front and back bedroom, with a bathroom in between, all connected by a hallway. Across the hallway from the bathroom is a door that goes to the living room. The living room also has an exterior door that leads to the front porch. On the porch, directly perpendicular to the living room front door, is an exterior door to the front bedroom where I was laying that night. Again, every door and window is open this time of year. Nothing but a screen separated us from the summer night's symphonic melody of chirps, bleeps, ribbits, and screeches softly cadencing through the darkness. As I lay there, drifting off, I could hear the soft rumblings of Papa's snores echoing down the hallway, intertwining with the sound of running water in the bathroom sink, where Mima was finishing getting ready for bed. I can remember laying there half awake, looking out through the screen of the bedroom window next to me. I could see the bathroom light dimly cast across the lawn just outside the bathroom window. Little did I know that one of the blurred shadows that my gaze had crossed contained something sinister, and only a flimsy screen mesh separated us from it. I must have dozed off for just a second, or the hum from all the fans running masked the sound of the front living room door slowly creaking open. I awoke to the sound of Mima's voice. She sounded annoyed as she said with a raised tone, In a minute, Welton, addressing my papa by his first name. Immediately after was a loud bang on the bathroom door, as if struck by two large fists, followed by a series of large thuds moving through the living room. A half second later, the living room storm door swung open, crashing into the exterior door to the bedroom where I was. There was one deep, bounding thud on the front porch before the living room storm door slammed shut sending our dog Blue into full assault mode. She ran off, viciously growling after something, until she went out of earshot and the nighttime summer sounds softly refilled the air. I remember wondering what Papa was doing making all that noise. I thought to myself, maybe he heard a raccoon or something in the garden. Then I noticed the drone of his snores still softly echoing from his bedroom. Before I had the chance to speculate further, Mima came into the room and asked me if I'd just tried to open the bathroom door. I replied, no, that I had been in bed the whole time, and I asked her about all the noises, but without acknowledging me, she turned and walked to the back bedroom where my papa was still sleeping. She woke him, and they spoke quietly for several minutes. Then she returned to the room and got into the bed laid down and went to sleep without saying anything. I'm not sure why, but the next morning I never asked about it. Everything seemed business as usual at breakfast, and I was distracted with the excitement of the day's activities on the farm. Besides that, as a ten-year-old boy, my papa was a pretty intimidating man, and he slept with a loaded shotgun by the bed. Our dog, she was only 50 pounds, was fearless and would run full-grown cattle like they were kittens. They really gave me a false sense of security. 
I eventually forgot about it until around 15 years later when I was in my mid-twenties. I was visiting with Mima and she asked me if I remembered that night. I told her I vaguely did and that I remember her calling out, in a minute, Welton, probably because it was unusual to hear her speak in that tone of voice. She chuckled warmly for just a moment, but then her expression faded to a serious one. She told me that several years before I was born, she had served on a jury for a murder trial. The man that was convicted spent 20 years in jail. She said that when the verdict was being read, she looked up, and he was just staring at her. She wasn't sure why, but he continued to glare at her while he stood there being sentenced, but she never forgot it. A week before my annual summer visit in June of 1992, she received word that he had recently been released. A few days prior to my arrival, she received a couple of phone calls where she could just hear someone breathing, and then they would hang up without saying a word. She said she just knew it was him and thought of telling my mom not to send me, but she felt a little silly and had no reason to suspect this man even remembered her, let alone where she lived. She told me that she'd locked the bathroom door that night because I was there. She didn't want me to accidentally walk in on her while she was changing into her nightgown. Any other time, the door would have been unlocked like all the other doors and windows. I guess when the man tried to open the door and she yelled out, in a minute, Welton, it was enough to spook him out of doing whatever it was that he'd initially intended when he entered our house that summer night. She said she could imagine him standing out in the darkness, peering into the illuminated bathroom window, a predator stalking his prey in all her vulnerability separated only by a thin, hollow, wooden bathroom door that could have easily been kicked in. Maybe it was the deep rumblings of Papa's snoring billowing from the next room, reminding him that there wasn't just an older lady by herself. Maybe our dog got a piece of him as she escorted him off the property that night. Regardless, he never came back though none of that would have mattered if she hadn't locked the bathroom door. And had she not, our night could have ended very, very differently. This happened back in 2021. For some background, I'm a male, and I was 19 at the time. I was studying at university in Canberra. I'm not from the area, having come down from Brisbane, which is about a thousand kilometers away. I was living in a student dorm, cheapest one available, about a two-minute walk from the campus. I had terrible insomnia, so every night I would still be up until like 5 a.m. The Wi-Fi was so awful in the dorm, which meant that most nights I would venture to the university library and use the free Wi-Fi to keep myself entertained. On this particular night, it was around 2 a.m. in the middle of winter. I packed my laptop and headphones and walked outside into the zero-degree Canberra winter night. As soon as I leave the dorm, there was a young woman standing on the pathway about five meters away from me. She looked to be my age, so I assumed she was another student like me. Immediately, her demeanor was frantic. She seemed very on edge, pacing a bit. I'm a pretty resolved person, to the point where I think I come across as standoffish, but being the middle of the night and freezing outside, I asked if she was okay. She was already speaking to me when I asked her, saying she's such an idiot because she lost her phone. She added that she's been looking for it here. Where we were standing, it was a well-lit area, being just outside the dorms, so I thought maybe I could help her find it. I offered to help, and she asked if I could call her number off of my phone, and maybe we could hear it ringing. We do that, but hear nothing. The whole time, she keeps muttering to herself how she's such an idiot. She also kept telling me that she lost it while going out for a smoke. 
She said it multiple times, as if she really wanted me to know this. She then suggested that we go down to the creek adjacent to the dorms that's about 30 meters away to look. It's completely blanketed by darkness and surrounded by trees. I was thinking to myself, how the fuck would you have lost your phone there when you said you lost it here 30 meters away? I didn't feel threatened by her physically, seeing as I'm a six foot man, but I didn't know what was going to happen if I followed her into the dark trees down to the creek. So I say, didn't you say it's up here somewhere though? She replies, saying she's not sure, and there's a chance it's down by the creek. I tell her that I'll stay up here and call the phone when she gets to the creek. She insists that she needs me to help her find it down there. At this point, I'm contemplating whether or not she really lost her phone. I finally say to her, Look, I'm not comfortable following a stranger into the woods in the middle of the night. She responds, pleading that she really needs my help and nothing's going to happen. I say that I'm sorry. I turn around and head back inside to my dorm. Where my room is, it allows me to look outside at the area that this all took place. So when I get back into my room on the second floor, I peek out the window. The girl is gone. Every 30 seconds or so, I take another peek. Eventually, in the distance, I spot a man wander past, coming from the direction of the creek. He then disappears behind some buildings, and I don't see anything else weird. I'm almost certain that if I followed the girl to the creek, something bad would have happened to me. This is not my story, but I have an add-on to it. There was a home in the middle of nowhere near Spanish Fork, Utah. Someone I know worked there as a staff member. It was a residential treatment facility for young, troubled boys. When the company moved and relocated to a building just down the road a ways, this one remained empty and just sat there. The guy I know, Matt, is a great guy and loves telling stories. He always has great tales of things that he or someone he knows has experienced, but this story in particular happened to him. One night, he worked a bit later than usual. He decided instead of driving the 45 minutes home, he would just go stay at the old house. The night started off as normal. He cooked some dinner and watched a movie on his phone while laying on a bed in the basement. As he watched the movie, he heard footsteps upstairs, but the only thing was, the footsteps went in a straight line and continued through what he knew to be a solid wall. There was no access, multiple walls in fact. He debated whether he should investigate. First, he called someone else who he knew would sometimes stay there as well to see if they were there that night. They said, no, I'm already at home in my own bed. Why? He explained it to them and they decide the sounds are just the house settling. He turned the light off and went to sleep. A couple hours later, at around midnight, he heard a door open and shut in the basement. Then he heard the door right across from the room he was sleeping in do the same thing. Now he was freaked out. Someone was in the house with him. He reached down to his bag and grabbed a knife. All of a sudden, there was a ton of noise coming from the room across the hall, loud banging and things dropping. But there were only files in that room, a filing cabinet and papers, no books or other heavy objects. Then the lights in the hall turned on and after about 30 seconds, turned back off before the sounds began again. He was in bed in absolute fear and horror of the sounds he was hearing. They continued to get louder and louder, and all of a sudden, everything went dead silent. Silence, as in he couldn't even hear power anymore. The heater wasn't going, and he said he felt everything going cold, too suddenly for it to be caused by the lack of power. He was frozen, and all he could do was lay there, imagining something opening the door and charging at him. 
He imagined that over and over again until the sun came up. As soon as it did, though, he grabbed his stuff and left the room. He peeked into the room across the hall, and nothing was out of the ordinary. He then left the house and never stayed there again. Less than one week later, the house burned down mysteriously. Investigators couldn't find out what caused it. Fast forward to a year later, I was with him and a bunch of guys, and we set up a paintball course on the property for the boys. We tested it out, but while sitting down, taking a break, I felt like I was being watched. I looked around and saw nothing, but then from the corner of my eye, I noticed what looked like a head in the window of the basement. I stood up and looked down the window well, and sure enough, there was someone there, staring right at me. It was the face of what looked to be a young girl, long dark hair, maybe around 13 or 14, and her skin was very, very pale. She stared at me for what felt like an eternity. I was frozen. I couldn't move. This was daytime, and she was in the shadow of the window. Matt called out to me and shot me with a paintball gun, which snapped me out of the trance I was in. I looked over and yelled out to him, but when I looked back, the girl was gone. He came over and told me that I looked extremely pale. He asked if I was okay. I pointed to the window and told him what I saw. He looked at me wide-eyed and told me that that was the window to the room all the sounds came from the year prior. We both moved away from the house back into the wooded area to the paintball course and never approached the house again. We never spoke of that incident to anyone or even each other. I sometimes would remember it, and I know he did, too. I would catch him giving me a weird look, and I knew we both remembered, but neither of us would mention it. I'm not big into paranormal activity, nor do I really believe in ghosts, but that was truly horrifying, and it probably should be enough to make me believe. I used to be naively helpful to all sorts of strangers and often picked up hitchhikers, solo and in groups, and I'd get them to where they needed to go. When I was 19, I'd moved to Huntington, a college town in West Virginia, and I worked at a popular bar. My shifts would start at around 9pm and end at about 2am. I didn't know anybody in this town or state even and I'd been there on my own for only a month or so. On one of these nights, one of the customers had taken an interest in conversing with me while I was working my shift. Me being a good employee, conversed pleasantly back. He was in his 30s or 40s, buzzed white hair, with a group of other guys, all of them tattooed and with leather jackets. He had been there going back and forth between them at their table and me at the bar pretty much talking to me non-stop for a good couple of hours. At around 1.30 a.m., he mentions he doesn't know where his friends went. I look up, oblivious, and see the whole bar had virtually cleared out. He was right. Not one of his buddies was in sight. He says they must have all gotten drunk and forgotten about him, leaving him there. The man is clearly bummed and concerned because as he tells me, he lives almost an hour away from here and has no way of getting home now, and it's the middle of winter. It's snowing really hard. He spends the next few minutes on the phone, calling the different friends that were at the bar with him, but no one is answering. I can't leave him in the bar. I can't in good conscience leave the man out in the snow. So fuck, now I've got to drive this stranger home in a place I'm unfamiliar with. In conditions, I've never really driven in before. I tell him don't worry. When I finish cleaning the bar and closing up, I'll take him home. And I do. We get in the car, and he gives me directions as we go. We're talking casually like we had been. Just superficial conversation. 
nothing even hinting at sexual or flirty. I'm not a flirty person, so I'm positive there was no misunderstanding here. Keep in mind, it's like two in the morning. No one knows where I am or that I'm with this random person, and it's snowing heavily. As we're chatting, suddenly I feel his hand on the back of my neck. It was such an unpleasant feeling. I remember his fingers swirling in the little hairs at the bottom of my hairline, which were too short to make it into the ponytail. Uh, I scrunched my neck and just calmly said, I have a knife, as I kept looking forward, driving. The swirling ceased, but the hand lingered on my skin. Again, calmly but more firmly, I said, I have a knife. He removed his hand and we kept driving. I figure whatever that was is handled and we get back to our conversation. Minutes later, I feel his hand fully against the back of my neck, his fingers wrapped gently around its curve. I scrunched my neck again and said, Seriously, I have a knife. I have a knife. He removed his hand once more and then in a very hurt tone said, are you really scared of me? After that, he kept his hands to himself. It was a long one hour drive, but I got him home and I took off. I'm 29 now, and it wasn't until many years later did it occur to me that the whole thing was probably a setup that he and his friends had planned. They probably left him stranded so that the chick he's been talking to all night will have to take him home. Moral of the story, don't let people you don't know in your car and also carry a knife. Growing up in the Appalachian Mountains, I could give you a million times as a kid and young adult that I felt scared or paranoid playing in the woods. It's a beautiful place, and I spent my entire childhood getting lost out there by myself or with friends. As kids, we never got too far out there, but you actually could see the progression of us venturing further and further out as we got older, due to the forts and carvings we would leave. This one particular time, like a thousand times before, my friend and I had just graduated high school, it was our last summer of freedom, and we spent the entire summer camping and hiking out there. We had decided to try and find a new place to set up camp, and walked for what felt like a few miles before we came to a nice clearing. The area was relatively new to both of us. We got the camp set up and fire going, and the plan was to wait until nightfall, smoke some weed, and play some Monopoly. For sake of backstory on my friend and I, my buddy is a smaller, real goofy guy, but he comes from a family of foresters and always had a deep understanding of all the trees and different plants you came across. He had no fear of going and camping out by himself. If I spent 10,000 hours in the woods, he probably spent 50,000. As for me, I'm a taller, sturdier guy, and as we got older, I spent more time worried about women and sports and the woods became a place for small parties. Also, I never had the balls to camp out alone. In fact, older me wouldn't go far at all when I was alone, because I could never shake the feeling of being watched, which was just paranoia, but it was still an uneasy feeling. Anyway, camp is set, fire is going, but it's getting lower and needs wood. Sun is down and we're both cutting up and having a good time. My friend is sitting on this little chair he always brought and loading up the makeshift bong, and I was crouched breaking some excess limbs off some of the logs we gathered for the fire. All of a sudden, this strong breeze cuts through the clearing. I couldn't tell you if it was the suddenness of it or what, but my friend and I both stopped immediately and looked at each other. The breeze went just long enough to flicker our fire down to a small flame. We both sat still in almost total darkness neither of us said a word. Across from us on the other side of the fire, we could hear footsteps. They sounded like someone was running and would slow down to a walk and then run again. 
definitely on two legs. By the sound of it, they were pacing back and forth over the same spot. Then, just like it had started, it stopped with a softer crunch on the underbrush. I knew by the sound of it they'd taken a crouch. I was crouched still and knew I was staring right at it in the dark. My friend grabbed my shoulder and said, Buddy. And when he did, I felt this surge of fear come over me. I could feel it and hear it in him. I'd been so fixed on the footsteps and rationalizing what I'd heard that I hadn't even considered being afraid. But this was true fear. It was raw and made me feel helpless. I could hear my friend after a while grab some leaves and he dropped them on the fire. For the split second the leaves covered the fire, we were in pure darkness. Then the fire sprang to life. We both quickly grabbed more leaves and brush and threw it onto the fire. I got some sticks and logs on there, and neither of us took our eyes off the spot or moved much for over an hour. Finally, the leaves crunched and it slowly walked off. Whatever it was had sat crouched watching us without moving for far longer than any animal would. It wasn't until after those footsteps disappeared that I realized the smell had disappeared as well. It smelled like a paper mill, spoiled eggs almost. For the rest of the night, besides whispered remarks, neither of us really moved or stopped looking at that spot. Nobody went into the tent, and I had very short light sleep sitting on the ground with my head rested on my hands. My friend never went to sleep. In the morning we packed up and silently walked home. To this day we talk about it. In the seven to eight years since it happened, my forester friend has not camped out there by himself since. This isn't exactly something I saw, but I heard and felt it. My dad and I went backpacking in the Yosemite National Park in California, and we stopped in a valley to camp for the night. In the middle of the night, I woke up to the sound of at least a dozen of what sounded like deer sprint right past our tent, followed by a loud thud behind our tent, and the forest going dead silent. I've been camping my whole life, and I've never heard silence like that in a forest. Not even a leaf was blowing in the wind. Something instinctively inside me made my whole body freeze. I couldn't breathe. I had goosebumps. My heart was racing. I was petrified. As I laid there frozen, I swear on my life, I could hear whatever made that loud thud start tiptoeing around our tent. I say tiptoeing because the steps were so soft and careful that it felt intentional, like it was investigating our tent, and I could feel its presence moving around the tent. After what felt like a lifetime, but it was only probably five to ten minutes, a branch snapped somewhere in the forest, followed by a loud whoosh of wind, and the forest just went back to normal. I want to say it was a mountain lion, just curious about our tent or something, and that's what I told myself the rest of our trip so I could sleep at night. But the horrible, horrible pit in my stomach and fear that washed over me was nothing like I've ever felt before or since, and it has convinced me that there are things in the forest far worse than people realize. I used to work in a casino. One night I was approached by an elderly woman asking about paging someone over the intercom. I tried explaining where to go but she insisted I personally walk her to the desk where they can do that. As I walk her through the casino, she started talking to me. She mentioned she was a medium, and how her family always strictly advised her against sharing that information with people. When you work in a casino, you encounter a lot of scammers and odd people. I was polite, but tried not to engage with her much on the topic. As we kept walking, she said something to me about my sister. I stopped and asked how she knew my sister. 
She didn't, but started talking to me at great lengths about my family. At this particular time, my sister was going through a very difficult time in life that was impacting our family as a whole. I was skeptical, but curious. As she went on, I was careful to neither confirm or deny anything, but just listen to what she had to say. She went into great detail about how my father, mother, and even I played into the current situation. She even began to become visibly emotional, as if she could feel what my mother was feeling. I was utterly astonished, as she told me that I, being the oldest and most diplomatic in my family dynamic, needed to be more outspoken with everyone involved. Everything she had told me was undeniably accurate and insightful, but then she shifted her focus. She told me about someone I worked with, and went into great detail about what this person looked like and how they felt about me. She talked about the dynamic between us, and advised me to take caution. At this point, she'd lost me. I couldn't think of a single person or relationship in my working life that fit that description. I began becoming more skeptical again and reminded her I needed to get back to work and to keep walking towards our destination. She kept talking to me as we walked and I began to once again find myself astonished as to not just what she was telling me but also how she would go about it, her body language, expressions, and emotional energy. As we got closer, she abruptly stopped walking. When I noticed, I did as well and turned back to her. Before I could say anything, she placed her palm at the base of my sternum. I immediately noticed a physical sensation. I became paralyzed and almost felt like she was stealing the breath from my body. I started becoming hyper aware of my surroundings, the lights and dings from the electronic games, the mass amounts of people walking by, but everything seemed to be in slow motion, or almost as if I was leaving my body. It could have been only a few seconds, it could have been 20 minutes, I don't know, but I felt as if I couldn't breathe, and there was weakness in my knees. I started to feel like I was on the verge of passing out. Casino security saw this encounter and approached us. When security interrupted us to ask what was going on, it must have startled her because I felt the shockwave through my entire body. She jerked her hand back and started apologizing profusely to me. As soon as she pulled her hand back, I was able to breathe again and gain control of my body. I was completely freaked out. It must have been visible because security kept asking me if I was okay. I assured them everything was fine, and they walked off. I turned back to the woman who was still apologizing, and she said, If you don't do something about that ulcer, it's going to kill you. I was so freaked out, I told her thanks, but I have to get back to work now, and quickly headed back to my office. Not only was I in a bizarre headspace, but I was noticeably completely void of physical energy. The entire experience was the most profound encounter of my life, and I will never forget those words and physical sensation. I was having a lot of stomach issues at the time, but I was far too scared to get medical verification of an ulcer. I previously suspected it, and it was a potential side effect of the medication I was on at the time, but if that wasn't bizarre enough on its own, it gets even weirder. This encounter happened nearly ten years ago, and it has sat with me ever since, but recently I was reflecting back on it. I realized that the second part about the co-worker that initially made no sense at all, all of a sudden it did. That entire situation played out in my life a few years ago. The description of the person and the very specific details were 100% spot on from what was described to me 10 years ago. I even realized that the entire situation was initiated nearly seven years ago from the moment this woman described it to me. Not only were the two incidents separated by seven years, but the person she described I hadn't even met yet and was in an entirely different state and company. I don't know what to make of this. I've come here to see everyone else's take on it. I'm open to this kind of stuff, but I've always approached these situations skeptically. I'd love to hear what anyone has to say about it.
I was 29. I was having chest pains. They were reminiscent of when I was younger. I rushed to the hospital just for it to be heartburn. I started treatment for that, but it got to a point where I couldn't move. I was sent home from work and went to my doctor. I described everything and said it just felt like bad heartburn. The doctor starts looking at stuff and treating me for GERDs. Just as she's about to send me on my way, she says she wants to do an EKG. After the results, she brought in a more experienced doctor who agreed with her and said that they want to keep me overnight for observation. I get to the hospital and they hook me up with a ton of devices. There are multiple tests and they start medicating me. All they told me before I fell asleep from the meds was I had an enlarged and weakened left ventricle. It's now maybe 3 a.m. I'm awoken to the creepiest looking doctor ever. He had this skeleton thin body, but with a round pot belly. Think Farnsworth from Futurama. He was bald, but with this greasy stringy hair that was like long, and he draped a few over his head. Meanwhile, I'm still drugged out and afraid of what's going on. He pulls up a chair and asks if I know what's going on. He says I had a nibble of a heart attack, using his pointer finger and thumb to indicate very small. He explains something about numbers, and if they hit a certain number, it indicates a heart attack, and mine hit the number directly next to it. So let's say 10 means a heart attack. I hit a 9. Bear in mind, my dad died of a heart attack when he was 39. I'm laying there freaked out. Everyone I know is asleep, so I have no one to talk to. I'm too drugged out to do anything. I just pushed the button for more drugs to go back to sleep. They did a heart catheter and said my arteries were clean. Months later, I found I had a flu-like virus that went untreated. It reached my heart before my body fought it off. I'd gone to a MedExpress place a month before because I was sick with flu-like symptoms, but they lasted two weeks. The doctor said, it's the flu, you're young, you'll get over it, and he never did any tests. I had to wear a heart defibrillator for about four months after that, and I'm on heart medication for the rest of my life, all because the express doc was too lazy to test anything, but that night shift doctor looked like death and I thought he was coming to tell me that I died. For context, I'm a 27-year-old male, 6 foot, and about 210 pounds, and definitely don't frighten easy. So a few months ago, I made a trip up to the local gas station to grab some beer. I walked in like usual and noticed a new guy working the register. He says hello in a friendly tone as I walk past, and I do the same in return. I go to the back and grab my beer and walk to the front. Very typical, nothing out of the ordinary. So I set my beer on the counter, and this is where it happened. I made eye contact with the new guy, and instantly my blood ran cold and my adrenaline rushed. My fight or flight was triggered, and I could feel every hair on my body standing on end. It almost seemed time slowed to a crawl, and this guy was just staring through my soul. I can barely describe the instant sense of danger and impending doom. Every part of my being was screaming, You're in danger. Run. Now. All of this was in the span of a couple of seconds, but it felt like an eternity. The silence was broken when he said what my total was. I was unable to break eye contact. It was impossible while I fumbled with my wallet. I set a $5 bill on the counter and quickly walked out, not even waiting for my change. I had a massive panic attack in my truck and almost crashed on my way home. I told my wife what happened. She chalked it up to, a guy scared me. I told my friends about it and they thought I was insane. I stopped talking about it, but the feeling and the image of this guy were stuck with me. A week or so after that encounter, I had a low tire on my trailer, so I stopped at that same gas station. I had change on me, so I wouldn't have to go inside for any reason. 
While I'm crouching down, airing up my tire, I start getting the same intense feeling. That feeling of danger, the feeling of panic, and that I need to run. Confused yet alert, I lift my head to look around. This guy is glaring at me from the window of the gas station. Blank expression, just staring me down like I'm being sized up or something. He watches me get in my truck and drive away, and I swear, I didn't see him blink once. The next day, I've had enough, and I'm getting to the bottom of this, damn it. So I decide I'm going to talk to this guy and figure out what the hell is going on, because this isn't right. I get to the gas station, and it's the usual lady working. I asked her about the new guy and when he'd be back around. She told me he actually quit working there that day. I was relieved and confused at the same time, but I figured I could finally forget about all that strange shit and move on. I haven't seen that guy since, but that feeling and that face still remains burned in my head like it was yesterday. I still don't go to that gas station, just so I don't have to think about it. Anyway, has this ever happened to you guys? I've tried talking to people and they always give me the same shit about it. If anyone has a clue on what could have caused this, please let me know. Thanks for listening. This took place around 15 years ago. I would have been about 13 years old. My dad has always taken an annual fishing trip with friends that would put him out of state for about a week. I have numerous stories about weird things happening while he was gone on said fishing trips, from paranormal events to someone attempting to break into our house, but this one is the most unnerving to people when I tell it. When my dad would go on these trips, I would usually sleep in my parents' bed. My mom and I treated it like a little sleepover and would watch movies, stay up late and gossip, even on school nights. I remember falling asleep after a late night movie and being roused from sleep what felt like just minutes later. My mom is a light sleeper, while on the other hand, it takes a catastrophic level event to wake me up from a dead sleep. I remember waking up feeling as if something was wrong. The room was illuminated oddly and there was a distant rhythm I was only partially aware of. I'm half asleep. And as I open my eyes, I can see my mom on top of the bed, on her knees, peering out of the window above her bed. I started to ask, what's going on, when she turned to me quickly and shushed me. I quietly joined her looking out of the small box window that was slightly cracked open, and the distant, rhythmic chanting became more and more clear. Our house sat in front of a strip of woods. The trees aren't too thick, and you can't see through most of the wooded area. The chanting was getting louder by the second, and the odd illuminations finally made sense. You could see a line of hooded figures in dark clothes, holding torches marching east, chanting what sounded like demonic, dark things. It felt surreal and scary as we held our breath waiting to see what they would do. Were they headed towards the houses to burn them down? Were they going to attempt to break in and sacrifice us? It felt like ages that we sat there, watching this line of people walk through the woods, their torches raised high, and their chanting continuing through the night. But that was it. They just walked away. After what was probably more like two minutes, my mom and I laid back down and discussed what we saw, trying to get back to sleep. We told my dad first thing in the morning when he called to check in, but I remember him not believing us. He thought it had to be a dream or something. That kind of thing didn't happen in our small town in Ohio. But the next day, there was an article in the local newspaper about a lamb being slain on a makeshift altar on the east side of my town. My dad stopped doubting us, and my mom and I got even more freaked out. My parents still live in that house, and we've never seen any other cult-like behavior in the area. 
But that one evening freaked us out enough that I decided to permanently camp out in my parents' bedroom every time my dad left town until my late high school years. If you stuck around, I appreciate it. Thanks for listening and allowing me to get my story out there. My friends and I were reminiscing about creepy stories this weekend. This one came up, and I haven't stopped thinking about it since. So I wanted to write it down and share. There is this hotel at a Bulgarian seaside in which we have an apartment. To be honest, that's a strong word for it, because it's just a big room with a giant bed, refrigerator, big windows on both of the walls, and a small bathroom. It's on a ground floor, and again, both of the walls are facing the parking lot of the hotel. Despite all that, it's perfect for me alone. It's right next to the beach, and that's why I've been spending some of my summer vacations there. So, July three years ago, I'm spending a week with my ex-boyfriend there, and three to four weeks alone after that. My ex always said that the owners of the hotel are a bunch of creeps. Whenever we left the room, we had to walk a path passing through the reception. That's where they used to sit all day, doing nothing. The old dad... 60-something, his son, Crumb, 40 years old or something, and his daughter, who was maybe 45, and her husband. When you pass, they all get silent and stare at you, every fucking time. I was used to it already, but my ex-boyfriend was irritated, especially when he caught Crumb staring at my ass, smiling. After that, he used to stare him down deadly, right in the eye whenever he got a chance. So my ex goes back to the city, and it's now the third week I've been alone, and the night is really hot, so I open both windows wide open and put the curtains above them to defend myself from being peeked at, of course. After all, I'm at the ground level, and my bed is right below both of the windows. I wake up in the middle of the night, and I feel like someone's watching me. This happens the next few nights. I'm easily scared and paranoid, but I was alone there, so I've been telling myself to chill, and that it's just my crazy mind trying to scare itself. Some nights went by without problem. Meanwhile, Kroom tried to talk to me about two to three times when I was off to the beach. So, it's around 1am, I'm falling asleep, and I hear some footsteps outside on the path. It's not strange, there are some people next to me staying at the same kind of apartment. Maybe someone's coming home, or going out partying. But the steps stop at one point, really close outside. I can hear all of it, because I have the windows opened. I'm sitting in the bed now, listening, when I notice that my door handle is slowly moving up and down. I kind of lose my shit, but I stayed quiet, and gave some nice job girl to myself for locking the door. After that, nothing happened and the person just walked away. I closed the windows, called my dad and told him what just happened. He told me to lock and close everything and that he'll come and get me in the morning. That was going to be a five hour drive. This was three years ago. Last night, we're having dinner and my dad says, do you remember your sea adventures? And he proceeds to tell me that he's made his own little investigation back in the day and asked the owners of the hotel for security camera records. They check the ones at the parking lot and see a male figure walking around. The part with the door handle unfortunately wasn't in the camera's range. My dad remembers my strange midnight waking up routine and tells them to check older records in which they all see a man going to my window and peeking through the curtains, standing there for like 15 to 20 minutes. The woman finally recognized her brother and told my dad he has mental disabilities and begged him not to press any charges and that they'll take better care of him. So, 
Good Guy Dad did not press charges, and it appears we're selling the apartment. Is anyone interested in buying? Strange and awkward crumb. Let's not meet again. This happened a while ago, but it really stuck with me, so I wanted to share it. I was at a friend's house for a weekend with a bunch of people, and we all went for a walk. My friend lives right at the edge of the countryside, where there's fields and woods and whatnot, so we went down this forest path. This other guy and I started exploring a bit deeper into the trees, and we'd gone quite far down a hill into the thicker trees. But then there was this clearing... There was a big log laying on the ground, and resting on it was a skinned deer. No bones or anything, just the skin and its head and antlers. The head was on a log, eyes missing, and the skin was just sort of draped down the front. Beside it was a crucifix, made out of planks, not just sticks, and it was tied up with a bale of string. This guy and I freaked out and I called out to our other friends to come see. But this guy told me not to show them because they'd find it too disturbing. He then shook it off and started climbing back up, but I just stared at it for ages. So long, he waited for me and told me to walk away from it. There was also a string attached to the crucifix that ran further into the woods, but following it wouldn't be very normal of me so I just went back. I still can't comprehend what it was. Some kind of pagan ritual. Some kind of prank. Not many people walk this forest path, besides locals walking their dogs, and we'd come far off the path, too. My friend that lived there said people didn't hunt in these woods, but I didn't want to push it with questions, since I'd been told not to tell her. I understand. I wouldn't want to know that there was something like that in the woods behind my house, but I find that the lack of answers has me thinking about it more and more. I think if I wasn't still alive today, I believe it was the beginning of a horror movie, where all my friends and I are killed off one by one by a forest witch. It was the perfect setup, friends hanging out at a country house for the weekend, Two idiots go deep into the woods and find something disturbing. Death ensues. I still feel it was some kind of bad omen, unless I really don't know anything about hunting, and this is regular practice for people who hunt deer in the woods. Can anyone offer me some insight on this? Was this a sick joke? A deeper meaning? Or is this regular hunting setup? What if it's a curse? What if seeing this cursed me and posting this now, pressing send, will activate the curse? I guess I will see. Back in 2015, I was working as a live-in home health aide for a wealthy family. It was just me and my patient living in a very nice condo in a quiet neighborhood on a golf course. We were the youngest people who lived there. I was 27 at the time. My patient was a 21-year-old male with Asperger's, SPD, and BPD, and some substance abuse problems. He'd recently gotten into some trouble and been legally declared incompetent. His name was Jake. Jake was a nice kid, but he had severe emotional issues and almost no social awareness, compounded by the refusal to take prescribed medication, which worked incredibly well when he took it, and also drug abuse. He was taken advantage of a lot because of the crowd that he hung around with. Right before I moved in, six friends came to hang out with Jake one day and ended up staying for two weeks, draining Jake's bank accounts on various drugs, meth, coke, MDMA and weed, and they absolutely trashed the condo. Jake was lonely, and he never said no to people. He wanted them to like him. Honestly, 
I think Jake was 14 to 15 years old, mentally. I think he turned to drugs to deal with depression and anxiety, and also to fit in with the people around him. He's much better now. It was a sweet gig. I was paid very well, lived in a nice condo rent-free, and basically just had to keep our house clean, keep food in the fridge, and make sure he took his medication. When I moved in, my boss, Jake's mother, warned me about a girl who occasionally stayed with her father, who was our downstairs neighbor. She told me that the girl was named Amber, and that she looked much younger, but she was 37 years old, tall, blonde, and very thin. Jake's mother was right. She looked much younger, about 25-ish. She said Amber didn't have a car or a job, and that she was an addict who liked to use Jake. Amber's father had custody of her two children, and she would come and visit the kids and stay for a few days a week. She said one day, Amber asked to borrow Jake's car for an hour, and ended up running off with it for two weeks. Amber was also the one who introduced Jake to the six friends who trashed the condo. She was bad news and was never meant to be allowed in the condo. She wanted me to call her immediately if Amber stopped by or Jake went anywhere with her. After the theft, she put a GPS on Jake's car and allegedly she could stop the engine. My boss made it clear that she didn't expect me to be a security guard just to notify her of things that were going on. Leading up to this event, I had a few run-ins with this Amber, where I had to politely tell her things like she was not allowed to come into the apartment. Jake could not take her to the store or anywhere. No, Jake couldn't go to a party at her boyfriend's house and other things along those lines. Amber was always spaced out, like she talked slow and seemed wide-eyed and off. She explained to me that she'd been hit by a car while riding a bike recently, and complained that she was the one who went to jail. I was like, how? Apparently she takes a lot of Xanax and was under the influence, so I think that explains the spaced out part. Anyway, she was never aggressive, but it was clear that she didn't like me, and often would say things like, Jake is his own person, he's a 21-year-old man, he doesn't need permission. And whenever she spoke to Jake, when we saw her at the gym or in the parking lot, she would be whispering to him, no doubt trying to manipulate him into giving her money or something. Anyway, on to the incident. Jake was out of state with his father, giving me a mini vacation. My best friend was staying over to spend a few days with me, and we were drinking PBR and watching RuPaul's Drag Race. It's 11pm, and we hear a light knock at the door. I go to investigate through the peephole, and I see it's Amber. I ignore her. She knocks louder about 30 seconds later. I watch her leave through the peephole and sit back down, telling my friend the situation. Five minutes go by, and she's back. This time she's pounding on the door like a cop. I'm getting pissed off because I'm off of work, and I don't want to deal with her crazy, especially when my friend is over. So I say nothing and go back to the couch. She knocks like a normal person and starts saying, Hello, Jake, Chrissy, I need help. Hello. I still don't answer. Then I hear her try to open the door. It's locked. It always is. I'm a habitual door locker. This enrages her or something, and she starts screaming and pounding on the door non-stop. I get up and look through the peephole again, and she looks like a demon. Her pupils were huge, so I assumed she was on something. She looked crazy. Her hair was tangled and wild. She was sweaty and angry. Looking back, I'll never forget those wide pupils looking at me through an evil glare. I ask her through the door what she wants. She says she needs to speak to Jake right now. He owes her money, and she needs a ride to her boyfriend's house right now. I tell her Jake isn't home. She then asks me if I will take her. I tell her no, I've been drinking, and I'm going to bed. She lets out a frustrated scream, punched the door, and left. My friend and I went to bed shortly after. I didn't hear from her again after that. The next morning, 
We're getting ready to leave to go to breakfast. I hear a knock, like a police officer's knock at the door. You know the sound. I look through the peephole, expecting to see Amber, but this time, it's an actual cop. I open my door and can see my parking lot is full of police. There's a van marked crime scene unit and an ambulance. I honestly assumed Amber had overdosed or something. The cop wants to ask me if I heard anything strange last night. I tell him about my encounter with Amber and ask if she's okay. He tells me she's in custody for the murder of her father. Does Jake own a crossbow and it's missing? Yes. And yes, it's been missing for weeks. The officer says I need to speak to some of the detectives at the station. So I don't know if she came to my door before or after she murdered her father with a fucking crossbow like she's Tyrion Lannister or something. But the detective told me that his theory was that she was a heroin addict and she was withdrawing and she needed to get to her boyfriend's place for more dope. She tried to get Jake to drive her and when that didn't work, she asked her father, who refused. This is what went down. They argued. The other neighbors heard it. She killed him with a stolen crossbow and stole his truck. She only got a mile away before she was signaled to pull over. She led the cops in a high-speed chase over the span of two counties before she finally lost control and crashed. The cops were only pulling her over on suspicion of drink driving, but when they went to speak to her, she told them that she was speeding because she needed a check on her dad. She thinks someone stabbed him. They asked her why she thought that, and she wouldn't answer. They sent police for a welfare check, and they found him before her sons did. I found out that she stabbed her own father over 70 times with various items. So, that was the time my crazy drug addict neighbor murdered her father with my patient's crossbow. Let's never meet again. This is the perfect place to share the story of an experience I had about 9 to 10 years ago. The reason I'm sharing this is A. I've really enjoyed reading others' experiences, but B. To see if anyone has had a similar experience, or maybe an idea of what this could have been, because I never have. Before I start, I've told this story to lots of people over the years. Friends, family, even acquaintances whenever supernatural and scary stuff has come up in conversation but I've always left out the finer details on purpose. Because honestly, I think I have some latent trauma from it. I don't like going into detail about it or reliving this experience. Instead, I've only ever recounted this as a 60 second story to elicit a reaction, probably as a coping mechanism. My girlfriend is the only person I've ever told the full story to. To be clear, I'm not trying to convince anyone of anything here. You can believe what you want, and I respect your opinion. But I'm also not going to debate or argue over something I know to be true. This experience happened when I was wild camping on my own in a forest in Wales. I live in England, near the Welsh border. This is something I've done dozens of times and continue to do to this day. I think it was April or May 2013 or 2014. The weather was unseasonably good, and this was the second of three nights that I'd planned for my trip, although it ended up being the last. The first and second day had been great. I got a lovely hike in, followed by a pub lunch. I'd driven back to the area I was staying, and I was now back at my tent. I settled down for the night read a book and had some beers, and went to sleep. It was probably between 11 p.m. and midnight. I was just in that state where you're semi-conscious, about to drift off, but haven't quite just yet. I slowly became aware of a melodic noise somewhere outside the tent. It didn't sound that close, but maybe within like 50 feet. 
It sounded like a person perfectly humming a tune. After listening for a couple of minutes, it was definitely somebody humming a tune. When I say perfectly, I mean just that. It sounded like a professional singer or something, because it was perfectly in tune. No voice breaks or falters at all. I can't remember whether it sounded like a man or a woman. At this point, I'm shitting myself because it's just incredibly creepy, like something out of a horror movie. I hadn't left my tent at this point, and the humming hadn't gotten any louder. It just stayed a distant, background noise. I didn't know what to do, but I knew I couldn't just stay there forever. So I mustered the courage to open my tent as slowly and quietly as I could to see if I could see anything or tell where the noise was coming from. Within five seconds of me poking my head out of the tent, the humming stopped. It didn't fade away or anything. It just stopped dead, as if someone had pressed pause on a recording. I'm still very on edge at this point, but at the time, I assumed that's just what it was. Someone playing a prank on solo campers with an audio recording. I couldn't think of any other explanation. Based on that assumption, I shouted something like, You're not funny. Fuck off. That made me feel a bit better because it felt like I'd addressed the issue, I guess. I don't know, but for whatever reason, it helped my nerves a bit at the time. I let that hang in the air for like 10 more seconds whilst my head is still poking out of the tent, and it stays quiet. I'm kind of satisfied by this point, so I begin moving back in. As I'm reaching for the tent zipper though, the humming starts again. Same tune, but much louder, much closer, and from the completely opposite direction. My heart sinks because there's no way someone could have moved from the first source of the noise to the second without me hearing or seeing something literally impossible. It was perfectly quiet in the woods, not even any breeze against the leaves. And yeah, it was dark, but I could still see short distances thanks to the moonlight. In the back of my mind though, my subconscious is clearly working overtime trying to rationalize this, and I guess I must have assumed that there were multiple pranksters out there with multiple audio recordings. I can't exactly remember what my thought process was at this point, because it's truthfully all a blur. But for one reason or another, I stormed angrily out of the tent towards the now quiet, loud sound. It sounded as if the person was humming within ten feet of the tent. I got up out of the tent, turned towards the noise, ready to scream at the perpetrator or even attack if necessary. That's when I see this humanoid figure silhouetted against the tree line, maybe 15 feet away from me. My best description of it is this. It was a large, thin figure, was shaped like a human, but way too tall and proportioned all wrong. It was huge, I would guess over 7 feet. Its limbs were unnaturally long, like it had been stretched out in all directions. Its head appeared very small and rounded. I think the figure was grey in colour, but I can't be a hundred percent sure because of the poor visibility. I couldn't make out much of its face at all. It just seemed to be shrouded in shadow. I definitely didn't notice any features like eyes, mouth, or nose. It was standing quite still, facing directly towards me. I say quite still because there was some movement, in the same way that a person or animal would sway back and forth or make some minor body movements and whatnot. This was a real, living thing. I know that for a fact, not an illusion, not a prop or a prank. This thing was standing right in front of me, and it was aware of my presence. I'm literally paralyzed by fear at this point. I've never felt anything like it before or since. Just a primal terror which has left me cold, shaking, just standing there quite literally unable to move. 
I distinctly remember thinking that I need to get away, but I couldn't physically move my body. It was the most terrified I have ever been. As I first laid eyes on this creature, the humming stopped and immediately it started humming again, but not a song. It started softly singing my name in what sounded like my voice. That sounds fucking ridiculous, I know, but I swear that's how I remember it. Even though it was singing in my voice though, it didn't sound right. The syllables were just off, as though a non-human had heard speech once and was trying to mimic it for the first time, poorly. I haven't described that well, but I don't think I know the words to do so. This couldn't have gone on for more than about 10 seconds, but it felt like forever. Me standing there, this creature standing motionless and singing my name. At some point though, every cell in my body just switched, and I managed to turn and run as fast as I ever have in the opposite direction. For maybe two minutes, I was literally sprinting through the woods in just my socks and PJs, with absolutely no other thought in my mind other than putting a distance between myself and that thing. I had no idea which direction I was going, or how I'd make it back to my tent. When I eventually stopped, I just leaned against this tree, panting for ages. The forest was still completely silent. I must have stayed by that tree for about two hours, waiting for my heart rate to settle, trying to calm down and decide what to do. I didn't want to go back to my tent. I was quite happy to leave all my stuff there, but I needed my phone and car keys to get home. I was several miles away from anywhere. I eventually made my way back. It wasn't too hard to navigate back to my tent in those woods because the tree distribution wasn't very dense. I also hadn't gone as far as I first feared. Once back at my tent, I grabbed just my phone and keys and I went back to my car as fast as I was comfortable. I spent the rest of the night sitting in the back seat on my phone, shaking. I didn't even try to get any sleep. Once the sun was up, I managed to go back and pack my stuff up, and I left as quickly as I could. After that, I took a two plus year break from solo camping, something I normally do every three to four months. So that's my experience, make of it what you will. That has stayed with me ever since, and I know it always will. I don't know what was in the woods with me that night, but it has scarred me. It has also transformed the way I think about supernatural experiences. If anyone has encountered anything similar to what I describe, I'd be interested to hear. Thanks for listening. This is my getting lost in the woods story. I feel like I've seen so many of these, and they're always so relatable. I've been wanting to share my story in one of these subreddits since it happened, so this is it. This happened about two years ago. My fiancé, my best friend and I, decided to go to this popular hiking trail near us. The trail leads to a giant rock that hangs off of a cliff. It's a beautiful look over the city I live in. It's a far walk through the woods. You're on the same trail going straight for most of the hike. The trail eventually makes a sharp turn, gets thinner, and gets very steep. You really have to hike up this part, and then you reach an open field. You can see the rock above you. You have to climb up one more path that leads you to the rock. Even though the hike is long, the path is very easy, and it's hard to mess up considering this is the only path in that area of the woods that I found at least. I've done it multiple times at this point, even hiked down well after midnight after watching fireworks on the 4th of July. Anyways, the three of us decided since we were walking close to the road that leads you to the trail, 
we were going to go visit. It was about 7 p.m., so it started getting dark really fast. We didn't even make it off of the first part of the trail I already mentioned. It goes straight for about an hour until you get to the sharp turn. We didn't even make it to that. We decided, since it was getting dark, we should turn around. We all had our flashlights on and everything was normal. We never set foot off the path. The path is pretty much dark, engulfed by the trees, but there is this one spot where the trees open up. You can see the entire downtown area of my city, and it feels very high up because this trail is basically in the middle of the hillside surrounding the whole town. If you've ever been to Pennsylvania, you get it. We got to the spot where the clearing is where you can see downtown, but it looked flip-flop. I don't even really know how to explain it. It looked like the town was flipped, like how you can flip an image on your phone, like someone took the town and flipped it the other way, if you get it. It was late and dark, and we were tired of walking, so I just don't think we really took it seriously when we walked past. I still felt the weird feeling though, and I felt like everything was backwards all of a sudden. That's the only way I can really describe it backwards, and we all said the same thing to each other. It was my fiancé who said something first, which is just weird because usually he'd be the last to say anything in a situation like that. All he said was that he feels backwards. My best friend freaked out because she gets anxiety like that, and she said that she felt the same way. I mentioned the clearing looked weird and they all agreed with me. They thought the same thing, but they thought they were being silly. At this point, we should be close to the exit, but it felt like we were going in circles. The path started breaking, like the path wasn't even the same we've been walking on, so we turned back around towards the rock to try to figure out where we were. We came back to the clearing, and it looked so weird that we took pictures, I do have them still if anyone cares, but you wouldn't be able to make out that it looks flipped unless you live in the same town. We knew we were at the clearing though because it's the only part where the woods clear and we knew that we were on the right path as we hadn't gotten off of it. We decided to turn back around towards the exit, but it didn't bring us to the exit. It also didn't bring us to the path that looked wrong and started to break. It was a whole new part of the woods we've never seen before. There was a door in the ground. It looked like a door to a mine maybe. We tried to do research, but there's no evidence of a mine being there. But there is multiple mines in my city, so I wouldn't be surprised if it was just old and wasn't on record. Beside the door was about five or six white chairs with what seemed to be white sheets laying on the ground around them, like little pieces of white cloth. Not very big, just pieces. There were also beer bottles. The chairs were in a circle formation, but there was no fire pit in the middle or anything, just the chairs. Looking back, it could have been a little campsite someone made, but man was it scary as fuck at night when you're lost. It really freaked us out, and every time we walked away, it seemed we just made our way back to the chairs and the door. Obviously, we start trying to call and text people we know for help. I even called my parents, but no one answered. It was late, so I guess that makes sense. We are lost and getting really scared that we're going to have to sleep up there. Eventually... After walking what seemed to be in circles, we just walked out. Like so fast, the exit was right there. We just walked on the path for a minute, and out like that. Almost immediately after we leave, I get texts back from people I was trying to get help from. And one more creepy thing, just to put the icing on the cake. There was like 1,032 pictures taken on my fiancé's phone at 10.32 p.m., like a burst. It was so weird. The pictures were all just white. 
It's also weird how his phone took pictures while he had his flashlight on at the same time. The pictures were taken during the time we were lost. We didn't go back for about a year until my fiancé and I decided to go back and try to find the path we made it onto. It was just for peace of mind. We couldn't find it. We couldn't find the door. We couldn't find anything weird except a giant meat grinder. I hate the woods so much. It freaks me out thinking about any woods or forests of any kind. That's just one of the worst experiences for me, but I have had a few. Honestly, I just hope people don't think I'm bullshitting. It sounds crazy to me, so I can't imagine someone thinking I'm lying, but I'm really just looking for a possible explanation. It's one of those things that bothers me to this day, and my fiancé doesn't like talking about it because there's just no explanation. My best friend and I will still talk about it, but it goes nowhere because we've thought of every possible explanation we can think of. So any similar experiences or theories would be great. So last year, I was working as a line cook at a popular chain restaurant. I used to be done with my shift at around midnight, and I would promptly walk home because I only lived 20 minutes from my job. I live in Canada, so it's generally been no issue if I walk home by myself at night. So I'd been walking home by myself for two months, when one night I decided to go to the grocery store near my work. As I was walking there, a homeless man was hovering around me when I was waiting for the light to turn. He was close to me, but thankfully he kept walking in a direction opposite to where I was going. Unfortunately, when he was hovering around me, I was talking to my boyfriend and telling him I'm going to the grocery store. I got to the grocery store and didn't see him. After I finished my shopping, I see the man from earlier hovering around the grocery store entrance. He didn't go in but he was waiting outside in the rain. When I looked at him, he stared back at me, so I decided to take an Uber instead of walking. As I waited for my Uber, I tried to hide behind some soil bags in the grocery store entrance, but then he found me and started to stare at me again. Finally, my Uber showed up and I got in. After that, I was too scared to walk home alone, so I got my boyfriend to walk me or I would get a manager to drive me home. A few days later, my boyfriend and I are walking home and were leaving my workplace's parking lot. There was one big black van parked perpendicularly in the path I usually walk through. No other cars around. We see a man hovering around this car and his side sliding door to his van is open. He's hovering around the door, so I found this weird. I make my boyfriend walk with me over to the sidewalk of one of the big stores. When we have our backs turned, he starts to follow us. I see this and I tell my boyfriend we need to run. We manage to run some lights and I didn't see him follow us. After that, I started taking Ubers or getting my managers to drive me home. Every Saturday night for five weeks, I would see a black van parked near my work and it would leave when it saw me leave with my manager. It would also leave when it realized that I saw it. For example, I was helping the bartender clean and I decided to look out one of the windows when I saw that damn van again. When it saw me staring back at it, it left thankfully. This scared me a lot, so my manager started to give me the morning shifts and when I had to go back to university and take late shifts again, I didn't see it anymore. Next time I do, I plan to go to the police. Not only that, I was already on high alert because one of my ex-co-workers had been showing up outside of my work. When I worked with him, he would blatantly stare at me and at one point brushed his waist against my arm when we had to work together on purpose. He would also stand very close to me at some points, almost touching me. I wasn't that worried about him because he's almost a decade younger than me and mostly just watched me. However, he was why I was paying more attention to my surroundings. 
hence it helped me look out for the other creeps. A couple of years ago, I was living in Colombo, Sri Lanka, at a small hostel on the outskirts of the city. The hostel catered to long-term guests, so I got to know everyone pretty well who lived there. There was a guy living with us, his name was Raj, and Raj was a middleman of sorts in the casinos. In Sri Lanka, the casinos are incredibly shady places, full of Russian mobsters and other low-life criminals from China and India. The casinos are technically illegal, but they continue operation through bribery and government coercion. I went to one of them one time, and it was a surreal experience. Anyway, my friend Raj's job was to take online bets from Indian clients and make them physically in the casino. He was playing with their money and was simply the vessel to allow individuals to play from another location. He played in some high stakes games and with a lot of money for some powerful people. Basically a recipe for disaster. One night, he messed up big time. One of his clients managed to gain access to his online system and stole all of the money his clients had deposited to play with, a sum well over $50,000 US, which is a fortune in Sri Lanka. We only found out about the theft after Raj's disappearance. A note was left in his bed, very cryptic. It said, don't look for me, I'm leaving, amongst other things. The guy vanished overnight. We made a police report and waited to hear anything. After a few days, the police came back to visit, asking someone who knew Raj to join them. The locals in the hostel were afraid to go with the police, so I volunteered and was taken to their headquarters. They took me to the back where I was shown photos of a body cut into pieces. It was Raj. He'd been cut apart and dumped into the sewer canal nearby by someone. They'd brought me there to identify the body. They never found out who did it either, and the image of those photos had never really left me. I'll forever be haunted by it, and I left the hostel shortly afterwards. The poor guy was caught up in some shady stuff, but he didn't deserve that. I'm a former medic. We responded to a car wreck in which an SUV had run off the road and into a ditch at a high speed, causing the vehicle to flip end over end several times. There was a family of four in the car. The father, who was the driver, was unbelted and was ejected through the windshield, after which the vehicle landed on him before continuing to flip. He was dead on the scene when we arrived. The mother was in the passenger seat and she was belted, but the belt somehow malfunctioned and she was thrown forward far enough for her head to hit the windshield and put a hole in it. She was alive when we arrived, but barely. The vehicle was severely mangled and we were unable to extricate her quickly. We had to work a trauma code on her while she was still in the seat. By the time the rescue squad could get the vehicle access to remove her, she had been without pulse for nearly 10 minutes. The second arriving unit continued CPR on her during transport to the ER, but she was declared dead shortly after arriving at the hospital. The back seat contained two children. My recollection is that there was a girl of about 12 years of age and a boy who was about 8. They were both properly restrained, and other than obvious scrapes and bruises, neither appeared to be seriously injured. Their vitals were in good shape, and other than being in shock, they seemed to have appropriate levels of consciousness. Because of the difficulty getting into the vehicle, they were trapped, but they could see all of our efforts to resuscitate their mother. Because of her condition compared to theirs, the main effort of extrication was to get the mother out first. The children were safely removed after she'd been removed and transported. They were taken to the same ER as the mother. Once back at the ER, the two children were thoroughly checked by the physicians and by radiology for any internal injuries or anything we may have missed. Neither had anything significant. What stuck with me the most 
was what I saw and learned as we were restocking our unit to go back on the road. One of the cops had let us know that the family was from out of town and they'd been on vacation. The closest family could not get down to be with the children for at least two hours. Soon after learning that, I was leaving the ER and I looked into the room where the children had been put after their trip to radiology. They were both on the same bed and the girl had her arms wrapped around her little brother. Both had thousand yard stares. I don't know if or how anyone had told them about their parents, but you could tell by the looks on their faces that they knew. I will never forget that day. I often wonder how those kids turned out and how difficult it must have been for them. My dad and I drove to his hometown in Mexico a few years back. We knew not to drive at night because of the cartel situation, so we timed the trip to have us arrive no later than 5 p.m. The problem was, this time, the border crossing took us hours compared to the 30-minute smacks we've experienced before. My anxiety was at its limit, with knots in my stomach, thinking about the worst possible scenarios from the moment we reached the border and every hour that passed without us crossing made me nervous. Now we're 10 hours away, putting us at 11 p.m. arrival, meaning we would be driving about 3 hours or so in the dark. If that wasn't enough, our GPS decided not to work in Mexican territory. Luckily for us, we made this trek enough times in my youth that my dad knew the cities we had to go by, so we would just follow the signs. Guess whose job it was to navigate. Don't get me wrong, I'm a great navigator by any means necessary, so it wasn't hard. But knowing that our lives were literally in my hands was absolutely terrifying. One wrong turn wouldn't just be an oopsie turnaround moment. I'm very glad to say that we had no missed turns or wrong exits or anything. What did happen though, once we entered the city that bordered our town, was that the cartel lookout started following us and taking down our plates, radioing each other to watch for us and figure out where we were going. One of them even tried to get us to stop, but that's the last thing you should do. Our family told us later that there was a curfew in place, so no one was supposed to be out past sundown. They saw that we stopped at my grandma's and watched us until she let us in. We were safe once they found out who we were. A few other scary things happened in the three weeks we were there, but nothing was as terrifying as the dry down. I do some volunteering at a hospital three times a week that involves me reporting to the hospital at 5 a.m. I enjoy the volunteering. I've been doing it for almost two years, and I have never had any issues. That is until last week. Last week, I was a bit early on one of my volunteering days, and I had about 30 minutes before I had to report in. I normally would have just waited in my car, but I'd been pretty stressed about things in my personal life, so I thought I'd go for a little walk to burn a little steam and clear my head. After all, this is in a pretty nice area, upscale West Los Angeles. So what could go wrong? It's roughly 4.30 a.m., so naturally the streets are all quiet, but it seems pretty peaceful. But then, up ahead, I see somebody walking in my direction. Kind of odd, I guess, but I didn't think too much of it. Him being out here at this hour isn't inherently suspicious. After all, does being out here at this hour automatically make me suspicious too? So I keep walking and we make quick eye contact when we cross paths and I suddenly got a very bad feeling about this man. I can't explain it other than instant. Sometimes you just have a bad gut feeling about somebody, you know? That's what I felt when I passed this man and I immediately went on high alert and made sure he wasn't going to approach me from behind or something. Very soon after walking by this man, 
and I'm talking like 15 to 20 seconds, I pass by one of the many parked cars on the street. This is LA, so there are lots of parked cars on the sides of main streets, except this parked car is different. There is a man sitting at the wheel, and the man waves at me and beckons me over. Again, pretty damn creepy, but not inherently worth freaking out over. But as I keep walking, I realize that while the car was parked, it wasn't off. It was simply in park. Because this car starts driving in the same direction that I'm walking, and it drives at a pace essentially matching my walking speed, at this point I've had enough, and my brain is saying, no. Nope. So I immediately turn around and start speed walking back in the direction that I came from. Then I saw something that, in the moment, scared the fuck out of me. The first man that I'd encountered walking the other direction, which was now probably like 40 seconds ago, was now standing pretty close to me. Like way, way closer than somebody who'd been walking in the other direction should be. And then... He makes eye contact with me, and then he starts walking in my direction. I am incredibly suspicious and more than a bit nervous at this point, so because it's pretty dark out, I decide to play a hunch. My car keys fold out in a manner very similar to a switchblade, so I immediately pull it out, press the button to make the key fold out, and I stare at him for a second. I believe he was caught off guard because he stopped walking for a second. Well, that second was all I needed. I immediately took off running at top speed, crossed the street, and kept running down it. I'm no Olympian, but I was on the cross-country team at D2 College, and I still run multiple times a week, so I'm pretty confident that I can outrun the average person I run into by a comfortable margin. Still, I didn't take any chances and ran all the way back to the hospital. So what do you guys think? I'm not crazy, right? I'm not necessarily saying that I was going to be the next prominent murder victim or kidnapping victim, but there was definitely something going on here, right? Recently, there was an Amber Alert, and my daughter was asking me what the beeping sound was all about. For those who don't know, an Amber Alert goes out when a child is reported missing. If you receive notifications, you know what I'm talking about. The alert will sometimes give information, like the victim's appearance, as well as the perpetrator, the location of the abduction, make and model of the vehicle, that sort of thing. My phone started beeping one evening while helping my daughter clean her room, an Amber Alert. She asked about it. I gave her a small rundown and that was that. However, it triggered a whole childhood memory I have where I believe with all my heart that I was almost kidnapped when I was a kid. To be clear, this isn't a memory that was laying dormant in my subconscious and this random Amber Alert and talk with my kid caused it to resurface in my mind. This incident is something I've pondered and thought about on and off for years now. I'm a 41 year old man by the way. It's just been a while since I've considered the factors and details of the experience and this recent Amber Alert and talk with my daughter really caused me to pause and reflect on the incident itself once again. And now here I am. As a parent, you worry about these things and do all you can to protect your children, especially when you personally experienced something truly scary like this. The occurrence happened when I was just a young kid. I would guess I was around seven to eight years old. I can't be sure, but I think that's a safe estimate based on the fact that much of those early childhood memories aren't there anymore. I do remember my kindergarten experience, which I would have been five to six years old, and also later grades. So this incident must have happened sometime after or around the ages of seven to eight. My parents took me to a neighboring city to do some shopping. 
We lived in a small rural town with not much on offer, so from time to time we would go to this neighboring city about 45 minutes from where we were located. It just had more to offer. They would take me up there for school clothes shopping, out to eat because the restaurants were better, and because my mom was a crafter. She loved to make crafts. It was her thing. There were different craft stores and a fabric store she liked going to up there. This specific trip, we went to a fabric store up there, Joe and Fabrics to be exact. This was a pretty big store. As a little kid, I guess most places seem big, but no kidding, this was a sizable store. My dad sat out in the car while I went in with my mom. He did that a lot, sit in the car when there was a store he just didn't want to go into, so I can't blame him there. I can't recall exactly what my mom was looking for or trying to get in that store that day, but I do remember what section we were in, an area with a bunch of racks with various fabrics hanging from them. Imagine a clothing store with circular racks with clothes hanging around them, and that's pretty much what it's like at this fabric store, racks of hanging fabrics. I remember this area being slightly toward the beginning or the entrance of the store, as my mom was looking through these racks, I begin to wonder, though not far, just enough to kind of look around myself. I was probably bored and started wandering around, is my guess. But I could still see my mom just up and over a few racks away, so it wasn't like I was on the other side of the store or anything. A random man approached me, and honestly, I can't even remember at what direction he came from. It's just like I was there by myself one minute, and the next, I looked up and saw this guy. It was like he came in fast and out of nowhere. I quickly looked over to where my mom was. She had moved a few racks up and away, but I could still see her. There was a bit of distance between my mom and I at this point. So here I am, standing behind a rack of fabric with this older guy opposite me on the other side of this rack. Then he speaks. Hey little boy, how are you doing there? I remained silent because this took me completely off guard. He asked, Where's your folks at? Are you alone in here? I stood still and quiet. Come here, I got something to show you. At this point, he started advancing toward me, coming around the rack to where I was. I quickly started the other way, but he stopped and started coming around the other way as well, as if to meet me in the middle. I was scared at this moment, and became instantly aware that this man seemed dangerous and like he was trying to get a hold of me. Come here, he barked. I jerked fast to the left, but he did the same. He had this wild look in his eyes. Whichever direction I went, he followed. But remember, there's a rack between us. God, I'm so thankful for that rack. After some back and forth movements from me and this man, I finally lock in on my mom and yell, Mom, help. You would have thought I screamed bloody murder it was so loud, but it got my mom's attention. What's wrong? She asked. This startled the man, and he looked over his shoulder in the direction of my gaze and confirmed, Yeah, that must be his mother. His demeanor completely changes, and it's as if everything is just fun and games, and that he was just messing around. And he said as much to my mom. I was just messing around with him. No harm, ma'am. My mom came to where I was, and as we reconnected, the guy just tips his hat at my mom, and makes his way out of the store. I explained to my mom what just happened, that this guy was trying to get me. I was so upset and shaken up. She told me I did the right thing by yelling and getting her attention. It was terrifying for sure, and I'm thankful something crazy didn't happen. Could I have been imagining things, like maybe this guy was really just messing around? I very much think there were nefarious intentions. Why would a random older guy be perusing in a fabric store? If he was there for something like crafts or fabrics, why promptly leave when confronted? I truly believe he was up to no good. Anyway, that's my story.
I appreciate anyone taking the time to listen. This happened about four years ago. Funnily enough, I now live in this house, but I didn't at the time. For context, it's a very large double story with a tall, timber side gate joining the house to the garage, and on the other side of the house is a pool with a gate that goes out to a public walking path along the river. The path is on a levee about three meters high because of flooding. This is my sister's house. It's a very nice area. Unfortunately too close to a caravan park owned by bikies, known for meth production and distribution. There have been many break-ins and creepy stalkerish incidents here over the past few years. Even someone doing something inappropriate to themselves in an old lady's backyard several times, released a week later every time. I was followed while walking my dog and a neighbor came out to help me get back safely. So anyway, one day my sister calls from work. Her little dog has gotten out onto the road. Someone has her safely. So I go to the house and pick the dog up, and I go to enter through the big, heavy side gate, which was open. It's a windy day, so I assume the gate blew open. Usually, we sit a very heavy weight at the bottom of the gate, so it can't blow open on windy days. I get the dog back in, and I put the weight at the bottom of the gate and take a picture. I enter the yard and realize the laundry door is open, Cursing my sister, because she did that regularly for the dog, I enter the house and realize the door to the hall is also open, which is something she definitely does not do. I walk in and have a look around. Then suddenly, this really heavy, dark feeling came over me. I have never had a gut feeling as overwhelming as this one. I get straight out of there closing all of the doors behind me and leaving through the other side gate by the pool. I was shaking. I called her and said, I think someone's in your house. She left work and I waited for her at the end of the street. We went back to the house through the pool gate. The big heavy gate was closed, but the weight was moved to show it had been opened. Both doors I closed were open. Someone had been in the house when I went in there. Later, she told me there'd been a man standing on the path outside of her house, pretending to stretch, looking at her house instead of the river for a few weeks or so prior. And yes, she got a massive talking to for leaving the door unlocked. Hello everyone, I live in rural southwest Virginia in Appalachia and heard odd whistling in the woods a few days ago at night. It started when I was playing airsoft alone in the woods at about 7pm in almost pitch black. I live a lonely existence and I was walking around the woods behind my house. I got to a clearing just on top of a hill and sat down to take a rest. Just when I sat down, I heard odd whistling. It was perfect whistling and whistled a tune I'd never heard before. It was clear and it sounded close, within 150 feet or less, and it came from directly behind me. It had to have been in the woods and near the property line with one of the neighbors. It instantly gave me chills down my back and I got the feeling of being watched. I, not being an idiot and having a brain, wasted no time in sprinting full speed down towards my house, hopping over rocks and limbs. The whistling stopped shortly after I got moving, but I still felt like I was being watched and like something was off. When I did turn back to look while opening the gate, I didn't see anything, but that may be because of the darkness and the distance I had moved. I don't think it was a bird, as the leaves in the trees haven't regrown yet. 
and it still stays cold at night, and sometimes during the day. But I don't know much about birds. I also doubt it was a person, as I heard no talking, no leaves crunching, and no other noises. I should also mention that the whistling started out of nowhere and did not gradually get louder, as if someone or something was moving closer while whistling. I should also mention that I've been in these woods a decent amount of my life, and I've never heard anything like it before, not even once. I was a bit tired, but I've been more tired before while being in those woods at similar times, and I'm also not one to hallucinate. The situation still gives me chills when I think about it. I've had the feeling of being watched before in those woods, but those feelings have never been so intense and extreme as that one night. I was hoping if anyone might know what it was. Was it an animal? Maybe, but we have dogs around the house, and most wild animals stay away, and I haven't really seen anything outside of a bear or two, and some deer in those woods. I should also mention that dogs occasionally bark randomly into the woods, but they weren't really barking at the moment when the whistling happened. I was hoping if anyone could identify what it was, and I'm not saying it was paranormal, but I'm not saying it was just a wild animal. Many years ago, when my daughter was potty training, a friend recommended I keep a travel potty with me. It saved me from rushing to find a restroom and avoiding stopping in anywhere questionable with a toddler. We would drive about 40 minutes to pick up my husband on his lunch break. That afternoon, we were headed back to drop him off at work and were only about a block from the restaurant when my daughter said she needed to go. The area we had just headed into was a large business park area with lots of very large buildings to the left and right. I saw one and the parking lot looked empty. I pulled over to the side of the building and parked at a curb. I had two car seats taking up my back seat and my husband in the passenger seat, so I took my daughter out of the car and set her up in the trunk to use the potty. I had just got her settled and she was looking uncomfortable and covering her face and looking down. I looked behind me and I see a woman walking up to me. It was summer at the time and very warm. She was wearing a jean skirt and a tank top and had a crossbody purse. She looked at my daughter and said, don't be embarrassed, we all go through it, and laughed. She said she needed a ride to the freeway and asked if I could take her. I told her that I was sorry, but I couldn't. She started to seem bothered and asked why I couldn't take her. I said the back seat is full, so I didn't have room for her. She snapped back, so you're telling me you put your daughter in the front seat? I told her no that my husband was the one that occupied it. As soon as she heard that I wasn't alone and had my husband with me, she started to slowly back away and walk down the street that she came from. As she was walking away, she said, Oh, I'm sorry. I used to be from here, but not anymore. And she quickly walked off. If she would have made a left on the cross street she was walking towards when going towards my car, there were restaurants and gas stations a block up, plenty of people to ask for a ride. I still am so grateful my husband was with me that day. I don't know what her true intentions were, but getting a ride to a populated area didn't seem to be one of them. I'm going to describe something that's happened to me twice in my life, and I'd like to know if anyone else has ever experienced this. So first of all, I'm 34 years old, and I've met thousands of people in my life, so this is a very rare thing I'm talking about. The first time it happened was with a girl. We were both in a store, and she saw me first. I noticed her staring at me in a very, 
very weird feeling came over me. It's hard to explain. I knew she was a stranger, but at the same time, I did know her. It was like a very distant feeling, but I felt it. And then we both smiled like we were seeing an old friend, and we talked for a while about our lives, and basically anything about ourselves that we could think of. And then there was a moment when it was like reality hit us both at the same time. She teared up and gave me a hug, and I remember saying, Yeah, it was really good meeting you. And she said, Yeah. And then I replied, I guess I'll see you around. And I don't remember her response, but I never saw her again. The second time was at a park. It was a guy this time. We noticed each other at the same time and smiled almost to the point of laughing, at least for my part. Like with the girl, I didn't know him, but I got the same distant feeling. And like with the girl, we told each other about our lives and talked for a long time about things ranging from our childhoods to where we were now. I don't remember how we parted, but I do remember reality setting in the way it did with the girl and then things become a little awkward. I also don't remember how we parted. Now, for the record, I did consider the possibility that we were childhood friends or something, and they recognized me, and I simply didn't recognize them. I genuinely had never met these people in my life. All you can do is believe me when I say that. As I'm writing this, I also think maybe some will think I'm just nuts and struck up conversations with strangers in an overly friendly way, and they just kindly went along with it. This is not the case, but I have no way to prove it. So basically, I don't expect anyone to believe me, but I'm curious if anyone else has experienced this before. When I was in college, I was walking across campus to my early morning class when this old white man with the bluest eyes I'd ever seen stopped me to ask for bus ticket money. Everything went still around us. No sounds. The air felt stiff, and there was literally no one but us outside. This man's eyes were like aquamarine, but the rest of his face, it was like his skin was plastered on. His nose looked stuck on like clay. His cheeks looked like they were barely hanging on to whatever was underneath. He looked truly bizarre. He stops me and compliments my lipstick and asks if I could help him pay for a bus ticket so he could visit his son. I told him I didn't have cash to help him. He never breaks eye contact and tells me he's a veteran and takes his wallet out to show me his military lapel. When he opens it, I see a wad of cash in there, and he looks at me again and asks if I could help. While all this was happening, the only thing I felt was that I was in danger. I truly thought I was in the presence of someone evil, though he didn't say or do anything to provoke that feeling. I ended up reaching in my bag for quarters and gave them to him. He held my hand for what felt like forever and then let me go on my merry way. I think about this encounter a lot because it felt like he was pretending to be human. His skin looked like it was made out of wet clay and wrongly placed. His eyes were so blue, they looked unnatural, and why ask for money when you already had it? I got home really late from a trip one night. It was about two in the morning. I had to park on a dimly lit side street to get to my place. As a single female in her late twenties, I call someone when I have to walk alone in the dark like that. I call my dad, who's in a different time zone about three hours behind. He knows the drill and we're just chatting. As I'm walking up the hill to my condo building, there's a cluster of small trees and shrubs across the street where a fence ends and a bank parking lot begins. 
two shady looking guys come out, one smoking. At first, I thought they were out for a smoke. They then started walking toward me, not toward another building or car, me. They then separate and one is on either side of me, which felt like I was being surrounded. As this happens, I tell my dad, which they can both hear from where they are. I have two guys coming toward me. I think you need to call the police, I say. As soon as that happened, they made a 90 degree turn and headed back down the street. I still think about it often. I sometimes feel like I'm blowing things out of proportion, especially when I consider that there were two nearby residential buildings that would have heard screams and that the threat of someone calling the police on the other end of the phone wasn't much of a threat because who knows police response times. Then I go back to my gut feeling. The way they came out of the cluster of trees made a beeline to me, then surrounded me in a creepy way that I can't explain, like they were very close on an open road. I still don't know whether it was all in my head or not, but that was a terrifying experience. Since that time, I've parked in the bank lot that's well lit, I have to get up and move my car when they open at 8, but that scared some sense into me. It scared my poor dad as well. This happened to me a while back. I was roughly 16 and just couldn't sleep. At 2am, I heard this loud noise that made me jump. I'd never heard a noise quite like it. The sound was a cross between a giggle and a scream. I paused my show and turned on the light. There was nothing there though. As I turned around to go back to my bed, I saw what looked like a shadow of a woman standing in the hallway. I froze. Did she see me? She began to walk towards my room, which was the opposite end to my parents' room, so I was worried that she was going to come and get me or something. As she got closer, I backed away from the door and started to go towards the left side of my bed. Next to my bedside table, I keep a bat for self-defense. I grabbed a bat and hid behind the side of my bed, praying the woman hadn't seen me. After about a minute, there were footsteps going down the stairs. I breathed a sigh of relief and got up, going back to close my door. As the door closed, it hit my toe. Now these doors were heavy, and back then I was a proper Slim Jim. I had no padding, so when the door hit my toe, I let out a quiet, shit. At that point, I realized what I had done. The lady's head whipped around, and we locked eyes. She came back up the stairs and came heading towards my room. I tried my best to shut my door, but before I could, she got her foot into it. Your father said everyone was asleep. Why are you up? My mouth opened, but words wouldn't come out. I was terrified. The lady pushed open my door, thrusting me to the floor. You were gonna forget that you ever saw me, young man, and you're going to go straight to bed. Do you understand? Suddenly, I heard my parents' bedroom door open. I shouted out, and in comes my dad. Shh. Indigo, for goodness sake. You're gonna wake up your brothers. Sandra, I thought you were leaving. I stopped for a moment. You know this creepy witch. My dad gave me the, if I could scream at you right now I would look, and told the woman to leave. You were not to tell your mother about this, Indigo. Go to bed. The next morning I woke up and figured what had happened. My dad was having an affair. My mom traveled a lot with work, so he was probably sleeping with the Sandra person every time she was away. That pissed me right off. Luckily my mom was back once I woke up, and so I thought she deserved to know. I wasn't going to tell her directly yet though. I wanted to see if I could pressure my dad into it first. So dad, fun night last night. He almost choked on his breakfast. He didn't break though. My mom asked what I was talking about and he just said he went out with some friends for some beers, and by the time he got home, everyone was asleep. In the end, he never told her, 
So the next time she went away and Sandra came and slept with my dad, I told her and they got a divorce. Ten years ago, my ex and I were struggling for money and ended up moving into a cramped old flat in a 1920s hotel that had been converted into flats. We initially were offered the second floor flat, but despite being nicer, there was this air of dread in it. We both felt very uncomfortable in it, like we shouldn't be there. So we ended up taking the first floor flat. Within a month of us living there, a young girl moved in above us. She screamed, banged, and came in and out at odd hours. My ex would bang on the ceiling, and she'd stop for a bit before starting up again. We complained, and then three months later it stopped for the most part. We still heard heavy, slow stomps on the ceiling, closing doors, and an occasional low moan. It wasn't anywhere near as bad as before, and only really happened at night, so we just gave up trying to get her to shut up. One night, we were laying in bed about to sleep when the stomping began. It started quiet before getting louder and louder until it was right above our heads. My ex lost it. He went upstairs and banged on her door. No answer. He came back downstairs and when it continued, he banged on the ceiling, shouting, Shut the hell up. We've had enough. It stopped and we finally got some sleep. The next day, I was complaining to the ground floor resident, Emma. She looked confused, then told me the girl had abandoned the flat a month ago, just up and left during the night. I told her I must have been mistaken, but my ex and I were very confused. I reported it to the landlord, who said he'd been doing minor repairs, but only during the day, and that he would change the locks in case the girl had been coming and going. Things settled for a bit, but then weird things started happening. Keys left on the side would disappear and show up in the kitchen drawer. Doors would be open when I swore I closed them. I was having mental health issues at the time, and my ex told me I must have been doing it. So I just left it. I stopped mentioning the weird occurrences because he wasn't very supportive, and he always blamed me for them. Then it happened. I was alone cooking in the kitchen with my headphones in. I remember it was stormy outside, and the wind was whipping up against the window panes. Suddenly, I got this eerie feeling that I should run, so I took out my headphones and looked into the lounge. Nothing. Still, the feeling persisted, and I felt the hairs on my arms stand up. I needed to pee, but to get to the bathroom, you had to go into the bedroom. Something told me not to go to run, but I ignored it and went to the bedroom and opened the door. It was dark, but I could plainly see someone sitting on our bed, and I shut my eyes, hoping it was just tiredness or my mental issues, but no, there she was when I opened my eyes. My hand was stuck on the door handle, and my whole body froze, when suddenly the person started turning their head towards me. I can see her face now, grayish blue, black where the eyes should be, a mass of long black hair down her shoulders. I screamed, ran out of the flat and downstairs, crying and hysterical. I banged on Emma's door and she let me in. As she calmed me, her husband went to check the flat, but said no one was there. I was too scared to go back up, so I sat with Emma until I calmed down. My ex came home and we went back up. He asked me why I was so anxious. I lied and said it was the storm. I felt I couldn't tell him. He would either laugh or say I was a psycho. I went to the doctor and told him about it. And a month later I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and given medication. I saw the woman once more in the mirror behind me, but I just shut my eyes and walked out. I told myself it was just my bipolar and that soon the meds would work. Three months later, we moved into another house. We were chatting about how happy we were to be rid of the place and how creepy it had been when my ex laughed nervously and said he hoped the woman hadn't followed us. 
my blood froze, and I asked him what he meant. He told me that a few times he'd woken up to see a woman with a grey face and no eyes standing at the end of our bed, staring at me. He was in a bad place at the time and assumed it was night terrors. I remember one night where he woke screaming and dashed to turn on the lights. He said it was a nightmare, but he now told me it was because he'd woken to the woman lying above me, almost parallel, staring at me. As I said before, I had never told him about her. We laughed it off, but I was creeped out for a while. A few years ago, Emma popped up on my social media. We got chatting and the topic of the woman came up. She didn't laugh. Instead, she told me that she heard that the flat above us used to be rented by an elderly lady decades before who had drowned in the nearby lake just days after her husband left her for another woman. I asked her why she hadn't said anything at the time, but she said I'd been so hysterical at the time that there was no point upsetting me further. I still think about this sometimes. I've been medicated for years and manage my symptoms well. I don't really believe in the paranormal. It seems a bit far-fetched, but I still sometimes wonder whether that woman was a shared hallucination or something much, much worse. My parents' house got hit by a tornado when I was in high school. You don't realize how fast those things happen until you've been in that situation. We live in rural North Carolina, not exactly Tornado Alley, but we do get some bad storms now and again. My dad had this habit of liking to sit out and watch thunderstorms come in. We were all inside when we hear him yelling for us to come out. We walk out, and the sky just looks surreal. There was a wall of black clouds sweeping towards our house at a disturbingly fast pace. When I say black, I don't mean really dark grey or steely blue. I mean black. Jet black clouds, like an ink cloud from a giant octopus, was squirted into the sky. I've never seen it before in my life, not even on a video, and I hope to never see it again. So, we were pretty freaked out by the clouds and the wind was picking up. I mean those clouds were moving fast. Someone, I think my mom, said something to the effect of we should get inside just to be safe. But things start going crazy even before we can turn around. The wind goes from a 7 out of 10 on the windy scale to a 25 in like 3 seconds. We turn to get inside and I'm the last to go through. I try to pull the door closed behind me but the wind is sucking the door open. I have to put both hands on the doorknob and jerk back with my full weight to get the door to shut. At this point it's probably been 45 seconds since my dad called us outside. We run to the hallway and start throwing things out of the closet under the stairs and climb in. The whole house is full of this absolutely indescribable roaring noise. It was like a jet was taking off on our roof or a train was driving through the living room. It wasn't so much sound as it was physical force. It made your head throb it was so loud. You could feel it constantly in the pit of your stomach, like the boom from a loud bass speaker. But instead of having a beat, it was just constant. It felt like your eyeballs were quivering in your head. The pressure changes from the wind also screws with your sense of balance. I kept getting that sense of vertigo you feel when you're standing at the top of a cliff looking down. It was an absolutely sensory overload. We all jump under the stairs and shut the door. When we realize we left the dog out in the house, my mom opens the door and yells for the dog, who comes barreling into the closet like a bat out of hell. We shut the door. At this point, it's been maybe a minute and a half, just 90 seconds since we were sitting in the kitchen chatting, and my dad yelled at us to come outside and look at these crazy clouds. That's how long it took to go from normal evening to absolute terror. We sat under the stairs for maybe that much time again. Two minutes, probably three at most. It seemed like a lot longer, of course. Everything was shaking. 
I was just waiting for the walls to tear apart around us, or debris to start smashing through the door. Then the sound passed and we came out. The house was still standing around us, so far so good. We got back out on the front porch, and the door won't open. I give it a heave and push it open a few feet, and squeeze out. The porch is destroyed. We had a small barn sitting in front of our house, and it had been obliterated. The tornado had picked up in the barn. It turned into kindling and threw it at our house. The posts on the front porch were all destroyed, and it was just covered with broken glass, nails, shattered two-by-fours, and pieces of particle board. Looking out over our pasture in front of our house, where we kept a horse and some cows, and there were just masses of trees down everywhere. One stand of pines to the south of our house, probably about two or three acres in total, were just gone. Our cars were pockmarked with hail damage. Our full-size pontoon boat that we used for family trips to the lake on weekends had been picked up from the front yard, rotated 90 degrees, and deposited in the backyard about 50 yards away. Behind our house, a massive poplar tree was down over the driveway and had fallen just feet from the house. Yet other things remained weirdly untouched. One of our barns was destroyed, but the other, standing maybe 30 yards away, wasn't even missing a shingle. All in all, we were incredibly lucky. The house sustained major damage, despite its appearance though. The roof had to be replaced because the suction from the tornado had made it unstable. In fact, to this day, you can still see the cracks in the walls in the corners of the top floor, where the tornado had nearly sucked the roof off of the house. But, we came out of it. None of us hurt and we even slept in our own beds that night. So, when I see stories like those out of Oklahoma a few days ago, I always think back to those few minutes of terror and think how lucky I was that those weren't my last moments, as they were for so many there. I used to work a graveyard shift in retail. Basically, it was a clothing retailer, and when the mall closed, I would come in and clean the store up, fold the clothes, fasten security tags, that kind of thing. I didn't have a car, so my day was me waking up at midnight, walk two hours, and get in an hour early to start my shift. Well, the road I took has no gas stations, businesses, or any sort of public place until a halfway point at a park. And I suddenly have the problem of my stomach not agreeing with what I ate before I left. So, I remember that the park has a public restroom. Now, this restroom was basically a basin with a drain for the urinal, a low-pressure sink, and a stall. The public restrooms had no door. We just opened going in, and a grate made an opening for whatever light to come in. There were no lights inside whatsoever. So, I use my phone flashlight, go to the stall, lock it, and do my business after turning off the phone light. A couple of minutes pass of me looking at my phone, and I hear loud, heavy boot steps coming into the bathroom. Now, I know people make the joke of, bet you're glad you weren't on the toilet. No. I learned fear makes your ass clench faster than a cigar cutter. I hold my breath as I hear these boots walk up to the stall and try the door. Thankfully, I locked it. I was about to say occupied when this being grunts and growls and starts rattling the door. I stood up, getting my pants up quickly, getting ready for a brawl, and I yell, I'm armed. If you do not stop, I will open fire. Now, the scary part was, I was bluffing. I had nothing, no knife, no gun, just two fists and a load of adrenaline. The next thing I hear is these footsteps tear out like a bat out of hell. I wait a couple of moments, tighten my belt and make like a bat myself, my hands up ready for what there may be. Thankfully, 
No one was there. I never sprinted so fast to that job, and I never stopped at that park again. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you have a scary story you'd like me to read on the channel, please send me an email or post it to my subreddit. You can find details of this in the video description. It's the stories that make this, and this is the best way to ensure variety in the stories I share. Thank you all for listening, and a special thanks to my channel members and patrons who now have special access to ad-free videos and other behind-the-scenes content. Becca. Lydia Adams, Girl Veteran, Legends CBZ 69 2012, Katrina King, Hospital Cakewalk, Dirty Diana, Quinta Siegel, Shirley Porch, Taylor Ruist, Annalisa Petrie, Jasmine Davis, Janelle Jensen, Jasper Roth, Alex, Monica Levelace, James Gargano, Sarah P, Fire 05, Mad as a Felter, Tierra Sanders, Melissa Kingery, Kitty Cat Luna 2, Chelsea Moffat, Ryan, Gabrielle, Jenny, Sarah, Zep Tepe, Sarah C, Sam, Amanda Jane, Vampy Debs, October Gypsy, Rebecca, Erica B, Maribel De Luna, Lloyd Rash, Jennifer Jenkins, Kelly Townsend, Mary Wright, Tara Harris, Elizabeth Knapp, Eddie, Sean Gorman, Sue Gordon, Spider's Web, Kay, Christy, Absinthe Alice, Dina Kingery, Snowball Rathena, Lady Drackard, Brenda, Pretty Girl 215, Amber Davis, Sigma Cube X, Leticia Acklin, Ali O'Neill, Gina Eberhardt, Lilypad, Ashley Nicole, Sarah Chifalo, May 2nd, 2003, Bella Plays, 2006, Skin Crawler, Stephanie McLaren, Borderline Betty, Kuro, Top Up, Kelly Ann Bain, Michael O'Malley, Neil Kavanagh, The Dead Movie Society, Diana Johnston, Taya Adwell, Danielle, Possum Posse, Crafty Kell, Brooke, Scott McKenzie, Megan Abrams, Jane Wiggins, Jasmine Davis, Jack White, Your Pappy's Dilly, Emma Lisa, Tanya Ferguson, The Wendy, Ember Hops, Alexia Tuttle, Ram Beltran, Elizabeth Mayers, Unladylike 13, Pegasus Genesis, Sheila Grant 44, Sona, Scout Mom 405, Cheryl Duckworth, Ashley Bray, Angela Reeves, Kim Thompson, Brock Bollard, Nick Bigdowski, Jessica Lasley, Yennefer, Clary Scott, Timothy Stratton, Melissa Kingery, Shane Stevens, Serge Vargas, Bart in Real Life, April Jordanet, Lisa Prentice, Mason Hayes, Sarah Price, Jasmine Thomas, Angie Lindop, Z. Harris, Kirby Harris, Yolo Sapien, Lavina Cordelia, Misty Racour, Michelle Green, Dixie Busby, Paula Ferreira Nieves, Samantha Place, Donna Cox, Stephen Wheeler, Melissa Moore, Deshaun Edmondson, This Bad Kitty, Gloria, Christina Myway, Connie Sue, Carol Zaffirano, Merciful Humming, Kelsa Rundle, Ashley Juster, Vicky Howell, Joe Tozer, Zoe D, Nicholas Johnson, Kimmy Love. Once again, thank you guys for listening. Have a great night.